Justin Williams, change that uh, graphic there. Justin Williams of The Athletic joins us now uh, on 365 Sports. He is live from Kansas City. Uh, I'm sure, like as I said with Dennis Dodd we had earlier, uh, way steep in burn ends and basketball. Justin, uh, so far this, this tournament hasn't provided a lot of surprises, but last night Kansas State uh, knocking off Texas to keep their tournament hopes alive. Um, I would say the Wildcats are pretty buoyed right now, aren't they? Yeah, especially when you're kind of looking at some of these other bubble teams around the country. Wake Forest just lost. Seton Hall just lost. So, you know, we're going to kind of see how these, you know, metrics and, and resumes look in the morning. But if you're a team that is on the bubble and you're still playing by this point in the week, you know, you're giving yourself a chance at least. So I think Kansas State still has a little bit of work to do. Um, they have a tough game against Iowa State, but that's a team they just beat uh, on Saturday to also kind of keep their uh, their hopes alive. So you get another big win like that, and uh, Kansas City could be working their way into that kind of last four in, first four out discussion. Justin, we knew that uh, Kansas was not going to be at full strength entering the tournament, but uh, since he goes in and beats them down, uh, 72-52, now it's uh, Cincinnati and Baylor coming up uh, later on tonight. Uh, your thoughts on, on the Bearcats showing, and, and obviously uh, you know Kansas dealing with some things right now, but that's a big win for the Bearcats, and just uh, how do you unpack what it all means? Yeah, I mean, on the Kansas side, you're right. You're talking about two first-team all Big Ten players and Dickinson and McCullough who are out, you know, I think thir over 30 points combined per game. So you don't necessarily expect them to, to come out and beat a Cincinnati team. That struggled this year, sure, but it has been competitive and has been in games. They actually played a, a full-strength Kansas pretty tough out in Lawrence earlier in the year. So, you know, the bigger thing, this is something my, my colleague C.J. Moore wrote about for the Athletics uh, today, is that Kansas can't shoot the ball. You know, yeah, when they, when they get healthy and those two guys are in, they're going to look a lot better. But they've struggled all year shooting the ball, and you saw that last night. They were three for 20 uh, on three-pointers. And just, you know, there were some moments where they could have gotten back into that game and even had some good looks and, and couldn't knock them down. On the Cincinnati side, like, again, same thing. Give them credit. They're mm -hmm. keeping their, their season alive. They're keeping their, their tournament hopes alive. That's a, This is a team that so many times, you know, has had a lead or, or been in games late and just couldn't kind of get over that hump. It's their first season in the Big 12. They had some new pieces. So maybe this is just a sign of even against a depleted Kansas team, maybe they're starting to turn a little bit of a corner. Maybe they're getting a little bit of momentum. Now, again, easier said than done. You get Baylor tonight. It's a team that you can just, you know, constantly throw really athletic, talented wings at you. I think it's, it's going to be a much tougher task than that, than that depleted Kansas team. But like we said, same thing we said with Kansas State. If you can keep playing at this point in the week, you give yourself a chance that a lot of other teams are, are losing. So a big win against Baylor and suddenly Cincinnati, who was you know completely on the outside looking in, not even in the bubble discussion entering the tournament, all of a sudden they're now kind of working their way back into the mix as well. What would you say is the the simplest path forward for Cincinnati? Like what or the minimum that they have to do to make the tournament? Yeah, I mean, it'll be interesting if they can beat Baylor tonight. It'll be interesting to see where the rest of these bubble teams kind of fall the rest of the night. Colorado, Utah play tonight. That's a big one. Ohio State, Iowa play tonight. That's another big one. You know, I'm not saying Cincinnati would be in if they beat Baylor, but if some of these other games break right for them, maybe they're a little bit closer than they expected. If And then it also depends on what happens to Kansas State, Iowa State. If Iowa State beats Kansas State and then Cincinnati goes out and beats Iowa State on Friday, then I think you're really like, all right, the Bearcats, they, they made it to the Big 12 championship game. And, and now they're right, they're right back in it. They're probably earned themselves uh, a spot in kind of that last four in. So it's, you know, this point in the day, this point in the week, it's a little bit too much up in the air. But again, if, if they can win, they're at least putting themselves in a much better position than a lot of other teams that are fighting for the same spot. Justin, just big picture with the, the Bearcats. What have been your thoughts just seeing this first foray into the Big 12? And I know there's still some, some stories or pages left to be written this season potentially, but uh, just kind of what has been your thoughts on this experience, uh, the, the competition, the, the road trips, all those things, but also looking forward, what do you think is kind of maybe the most glaring thing or two about what needs to be worked on or improved? Yeah, I mean, I think a couple things. One, if you're a Cincinnati fan and you can kind of step back and remove yourself from some of the, the tough losses or games they could have had, they've been competitive pretty much in, in every single game in Big 12 play. And for a team that you know has really kind of had to rebuild and fight its way back the past couple of years, even in the American Conference the last two years under Wes Miller, for them to come out and, and I think you know kind of compete the way they did in the Big 12, that's encouraging if you're looking at the long-term trajectory of Wes Miller and the program. So, you know, I think that, that, you know, as much as it might be tough to look at that at the moment right now, that that's a good sign for Cincinnati moving forward. They clearly, they need a wing who can score, 
and that's what they're going to be after in the in the transfer portal this off season. A guy like Steve Mosukoshis, who's played really well here the past two games in Kansas City, they kind of tried to make him the number one option, and I think that was a lot to put on his shoulders this year. And so, you know, I give Cincinnati credit in terms of the way they built the roster from a defensive standpoint, rebounding standpoint. They, they've been one of the best defensive teams in the country this year. I think what they realized in the Big 12, though, is it's not just good enough to be a good defensive team. Like, you got to have a bucket getter. you got to have some guys who, when things break down, because there are other good defenses in this league who, who you can give the ball to and, and have something create. And so I think they probably learned a lot from their experience this first year. And I'm interested to see, no matter how it ends, you know, the rest of the week here, interested to see how they kind of adjust and what, uh, you know, pointers they take from the season in terms of how they build it for next year. Justin, uh, what has been the scuttlebutt around the open coaching jobs now? Mike Boynton at Oklahoma State and West Virginia um, uh, with uh, their interim situation now ending. Yeah, so West Virginia, Josh Eiler uh, was was kind of everyone expected that to, to open up to a full search. I think there's a couple interesting names to watch. Uh, Kearns, who's the, the coach over at Appalachian State, had a really good year in the Sun Belt. Um, I think he would, he's obviously already kind of in that region, um, understands what it takes to recruit to that area. Uh, they, they play good defense. I think that's something that um, West Virginia is looking for as a, another defensive minded coach. But also, like, you know, maybe you're West Virginia and you wonder, like, all right, where's Dusty May going to go? Everyone talks about Ohio State. It looks like Indiana's not opening up. If, if things kind of shake out and, and Dusty May is, is still at, FAU and, and no one's kind of poached him, maybe you're West Virginia and you try and take a run at him and just kind of see how that goes. You know, Oklahoma State, it's another one. It's, it's, it's still water, right? It's, it's kind of you have to understand what that area is like and how to recruit to it. We've seen that Mike Boynton has been able to get players there. They just haven't always translated to success on, on the court. Um, I wonder if Nico Medvedev over at uh, uh, Colorado State, you know, he's a guy who's had a lot of success in the Mountain West. He's kind of a name that maybe he likes it there. Maybe he wants to stay there, but, you know, maybe you kind of kick the tires and make someone like that tell you no if, if you're Oklahoma State. I want to ask you uh, kind of a two-part question here about a couple of different topics that came out of Brett Yormark's uh, address with the media. Uh, one, your thoughts on establishing Kansas City, or con- I mean, establishing Kansas City, continuing on with the Big 12 tournament in Kansas City as it, as it has been for a while now. Uh, your thoughts on that, just as the conference continues to grow and bring in parts from all over the country. And, and also, what are your, your overall thoughts on the, the expanded March Madness ideas that are being floated around right now? Yeah, I mean, as far as KC, like, look, Brett Yormark has shown that he's not against kind of changing things up. They're they're having football media days at uh, in Las Vegas uh, for you know the next season, and that's something that's been in Dallas. Uh, so he's clearly, if it were an opportunity that I think you want to pursue, I think he would. Uh, they've tried some different places in the Big Twelve. I know in the past for Kansas City, you know, my guess I don't obviously know the details of the financials of the situation. I'm guessing that Kansas City and T-Mobile Center kind of. You know, definitely made it worth their while to stay here. And when you're a conference tournament, you you know, part of it is you want to sell tickets, right? Kansas is 40 minutes down the road. This wasn't Kansas's year in the Big 12 tournament, clearly. But I think you always know that there's going to be a good Kansas contingent. We've seen Iowa State have success this year. They travel here really well. Uh, Kansas State's another one. So, you know, I, I think maybe in the future there was some sense that they could try some different places with the four corner schools coming in. But I also think uh, it made a lot of sense, especially if they could get the things they want to keep it here in Kansas City. It was just from, you know, my perspective of someone flying in, really easy city to navigate um, and, and and plenty of, you know, good barbecue to give me the meat sweats. So I'm, I'm not against that. For, for the tournament, you know, Brett Yormark said the quiet part out loud, right? If, if the tournament expands to 76 teams, that probably helps the Big 12. You know, teams like Kansas State and Cincinnati are fighting on the bubble this year. They probably get in in a 76-team tournament. So I don't know that I necessarily like it as someone who's a basketball fan and watching the NCAA tournament and all these fans out there that are looking at the bubble this year and being like, man, these kind of underachieving power conference teams are just going to give them a little – you know, freebie walk to, to a playing game or something like that. I totally get that perspective, but Brett Yormark is the commissioner of the Big 12, and if this is going to help the Big 12, then I think it totally makes sense why he would come out and say that uh, he understood the benefits and, and was in favor of it. What do you think about Greg Sankey essentially saying that, um, you know, they need to look at taking away automatic qualifiers for the one-bid leaks? Yeah, I mean, this is, you know, again, kind of a similar situation. Greg Sankey is the SEC commissioner. So, yeah, he has a ton of power. It's uh, the, the best conference in terms of football and holds the most power that way. 
But when Greg Sagan comes out and says these things and people get mad at him or, or whatever, like he's not the commissioner of the NCAA or, or you know, the college football playoff. He's going to work in the best interest of the SEC. So sure, I might not always like or agree with some of the things he says, but he's working on behalf of his members, his constituents. And so, of course, he's going to kind of work in their best interest. I think what you, you know, we saw it a little bit or at least heard behind the scenes when there was talk about 14-team playoff and the Big Ten and SEC getting those automatic buys. Like, apparently there was, you know, a, a lot of, you know, people, a lot of member institutions that stood up and kind of pushed back against that. doesn't sound like that's going to happen. I think for uh, something like whatever Greg Finke mentions these ideas, for those things to not kind of come to fruition, you're going to have a lot of people band together within the NCAA, within these institutions, and, and let them know why they don't want that to happen. Unfortunately, as we've seen over the history of the NCAA, it's kind of been tough to get unified voices and, and some uh, centralized leadership. So I don't necessarily um, agree with Greg Sinke on that, but I also understand why he's saying what he's saying. Justin, uh, it's we don't know about half of the bracket right now. We know that uh, Texas Tech has advanced over BYU uh, and Houston right now in, in full control over TCU. So I guess we'll, we'll let those other two games later on tonight play out, but uh, what do you think about a Tech-Houston matchup in the semis of uh, the Big 12 tournament? Yeah, I mean, based on today, probably first team to 40 is going to win that game tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, right. uh, I think I think it was 16 to nothing. Houston started out uh, against uh, TCU. Uh, when I came down here to start talking to you guys, TCU was like 0 for 10 from three-point range. I, I don't know if they've hit one yet or not. But uh, in, in Texas Tech, like BYU, everyone knows that team can get hot. They can they can shoot it from three. And then Tech did a good job, of you know, for the most part today of just kind of clamping down. So, uh, those are two really good teams. Houston obviously has been kind of the class of the conference all season long. But um, if, if anyone's coming out for that game tomorrow in Kansas City, I, I would not expect to, to be like a barn burner. I would take the under for sure. Justin, uh, what are your thoughts on the uh, college football playoff expansion that is on the way? The the Big 12 and ACC, everybody appears set to vote on it. It could happen um by tomorrow, uh, that we know what the the format's going to be. Uh, what do you think about the decisions that have been made there? Yeah, you know, Brett Yormark's been very present here the first couple of days of, of the Big 12 tournament. I have yet to see him today. Now, you know, maybe he's out sampling the, the barbecue of Kansas City, but it sounds like he might have some uh, some other things going on. So, you know, I'm sure you guys have talked about it a ton. Like, what's frustrating, you know, for, for me, as a, again, as a fan of, of the sport and someone who's covering it, is it seemed like the 12 team playoff like that actually had college football fans excited there seemed to be some people taking concessions on on either side in terms of automatic qualifiers at large and you know even Notre Dame's willing to say hey we might not get a bye but you know we'll, we'll kind of go along with this and before you know obviously that goes back to before the the SEC took Texas and Oklahoma and that kind of screwed the whole thing up but, you know, now before we even get to the 12-team playoff, we have a 14-team playoff, and we're talking about, you know, model 3-3, three, 2-2, three, two, two, one, one, whatever models and automatic, you know, spots and things like that. And it's just a little bit frustrating to see. It, it almost felt like college football had kind of, you know, in spite of itself, stumbled into something that fans were excited about. And before we even get there, you know, now we're talking 14 and all a bunch of these changes. So. I'm a hypocrite because I'm going to watch it and I'm going to cover it. And, uh, you know, I think, I think a lot of people, you know, like us probably feel the same way, but I can't, I'd be lying if I said it wasn't a little disappointing that before we even got to something new and kind of exciting, we're, we're finding a way to, to change it all up again. I, I cannot imagine like, College football is like a restaurant that's like always been kind of good. And then they like <laughs> stumble across like a menu item that everybody loves and like, whoa, 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 here's what we're going to do. We're going to put, uh, we're going to make a pizza out of it. And you're like, no, I like the thing. <laughs> you had it. Don't, don't go too far. Just, just stop. You yeah. Know? But you're right. They, they kind of stumbled into something that worked for them. And they're like, Hey, you guys, you think you might like this. What if we go ahead and screw it up real quick, just as you were getting used to it. So, yeah. you know, again, may, maybe I'm wrong you know, and, and I'm going to watch it. And I think a lot of people will, but uh, it just, it seems like there was some like actual excitement and momentum among fans who can be a little frustrated about this stuff. Uh, understandably with college football. And, and they, they found a way to kind of give us something new that I'm not sure anyone was asking for. Absolutely. Justin Williams, the athletic Justin, enjoy the rest of your time in Kansas city. One of the great uh, basketball tournaments you can go to. Absolutely. Always appreciate you guys having me on. Thank you. Justin Williams of The Athletic here with us on 360.